Hey guys, this is Michael Lane uh, at Radio Liftport. I'm going to introduce Kanan Martin. Kanan has been doing an awful lot of work with us from a technical imagery perspective. Welcome, welcome to the show, Kanan. Hey, how are you? Good, good, good. Hey, as a curious question, how'd you wind up with the middle name Sky? Kanan Sky Martin. It's an island off the coast of Ireland or Scotland, I don't remember which, and my mother's really into anything Nordic or of that old style over there, and she just thought it was a cool name. So wow. It was originally going to be my first name, but the acronym would have been Sam Sky Aaron Martin, and as the pregnancy went on, she decided she hated that idea. Okay, all right, <laughs> all right, cool. Well, very good. So nice to have you, Kanan. Um, I'd like you to start talking a little bit about your background, you know, who you are as a human being, um, a little bit about your, 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 your background, a little bit about your education, um, and then, you know, talk about any successes or failures or, or, you know, just, you know, how did you wind up here? Gotcha. Um, yeah, so I, I live in Tucson now. I was born and raised here. Um, I actually lived in the same room for about 21 years, though I was allowed to leave it. Uh, <laughs> uh, other than that, I mean, I went to a, a private school for K through 8 and then went to University High, which is a public school that you have to test into as a college prep. Uh, and then I attended Pima Community College for about seven years. It should be about a two-year program, but I didn't know what I wanted to do. So I just kept going, did everything from ge or, uh, geography to geology to chemistry to physics to psychology to humanity to all of it. And it was actually really good because uh, I accidentally walked in with a buddy to the counselor's office and I was still just chugging along and the counselor asked me to if he could review my records and I said there wasn't really a worry about it. He said, well, let's do it. And so in doing that, he found out that I already had my associate's degree and that I was about to get another one, and he said it was time to go to the U of A. <laughs> <laughs> so I took his advice, and I went and I applied, and then I've been in the U of A ever since. Uh, this is coming up on my fifth year there as I'm completing a five-year architecture program. Uh, once completed with that program, I look to go forward to get my master's at probably the University of Houston in their field of Masters of uh, uh, Science and Space Architecture. Okay, so you're in the summer between your fourth and fifth year in architecture school. Why in the world would you emphasize on space? I mean, with, with that kind of background, uh, you, could, you could go and design office buildings, you could put additions on people's houses, you could work on prisons, you could work on libraries. Why, uh, why, how did you wind up working with, with Liftport, and what are you trying to do in space? Space has been interesting to me since I was extremely young. All of the Legos I ever owned were space Legos, and I, that contributed to architecture as well. Uh, I mean, Star Wars was the best movie ever, forever and ever. I actually watched it last night while I was working on some stuff for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, just, it's, it's kind of a calling, and I have a brain that wants to design, but is also very... Uh, set up to be an engineer and so this seems like a nice merger of the two because when you come into like the residential it's all in the aesthetics and though interesting with the materiality and what you can do with design I I like to focus on the actual details and to see something really working the way that you want it to work gives me more pleasure than to see something just to look the way that you want it to look and so I think that's what kind of pushes me and drives me into this more technical field. And then I'm just in love with space. I mean, it's way cooler than the ocean, in my opinion. So, <laughs> and land, land is boring. <laughs> so I, I guess that that kind of answers it for me. I just really love it. I I think that humanity needs to get off of this planet. That we should always live here, but we should continue on throughout the solar system and potentially the galaxy to just ex expand life and find other life, hopefully, or just other things out there that are cool. I mean. If we stop learning, then there's no reason to exist. Yeah, right. So, so the program in Houston, what's what's that all about? That's a two and a half year master's program, and that covers everything from designing an actual mission to developing an actual spacecraft and all the in betweens. Learning all about life support to systems to just what happens has to happen in aerodynamics through and out of the atmosphere. Um, the the school is actually, it's called space architecture, but it's the focus on architecture of extreme environments. So 
anything from underwater to a desert to the Arctic to space, where humans don't naturally live, that's where I want to be able to put people. Awesome. Great. Uh, so one of the things I'm hearing kind of as a recurring theme is that this is the collision, if you will, of an awful lot of different specialties and interests that this combines a, a certain amount of expertise in robotics, energy systems, electrical systems, human life systems, uh, but then the structural components. And and what do you make of all that? How, how, does, that, uh, how does that impact like a project like like the lunar space elevator infrastructure? Well, I think, I mean, I've always kind of considered myself in certain senses as a jack of all trades. And a lot of architecture college is actually training people to be jacks of all trades because there's so much that everyone has to know. There's almost no way that one person can do all of it. And so if you have little bits of information across a vast variety of fields, you not only know where you can pinpoint, but also who to talk to in those fields. And so it's only been helpful, especially when I was introduced to Liftport and working with the different scientists and people that, well, they can help with any of these different things from physics to electronics. And knowing the questions to ask and the people to look to ask those questions to drastically increases my efficiency through any kind of design process. So let's, let's talk about what you're working on now and, and how does this happen. So let's, let's showcase some of your uh, images. Um, Absolutely. Uh, for those, the, those listening, um, Kanan came in wanting to uh, design a lunar shelter, a, a lunar habitat, and I'm not making this up. It's something like nine stories deep of uh, underground sublunar habitats. Something like a thousand people were supposed to live there, and yep. I, uh, I saw it, and it was it was kind of beautiful in the, from an artistic perspective. But I flat out laughed at him and said, "I can't use a system like that. I am interested in building a current real life system." And that's a science fiction system. So if you're interested in doing a real life project, then I'm happy to chat with you. If you want to, if you insist on building science fiction, then I'm not interested. So what was your reaction to that? Um, I think that it's a real life project, just in far from the future. <laughs> so, <Okay. laughs> so I, I think that initially I was kind of like, hey, come on. But you're right. I mean, we have to look at time frame, and I definitely will be dead before anything like that ever goes on. So, why not? <laughs> All right. Cool. Why not? Why not? Um, we'll uh, uh, we'll link to that nine-story superstructure uh, at the description of the video, so people can see that because it is quite it's quite a lot of work, and it is beautiful, but it's not relevant to what we're trying to do today. <laughs> no, it is, it's right. not. <laughs> so let's talk about what we're doing today. Uh, let's, let's show some of the images that you've been creating. And uh, uh, let, let's, let, let's see the ecosphere first. Um, in the next day or two, we're going to have uh, uh, Ken Murphy come in and really explain this ecosphere image. But uh, let's let's talk about you know what this thing is. It, to me, um, just based off of the information that I was able to understand, I mean, this some of the stuff is a lot more in depth than I'm able to really comprehend. But what it boils down to is it shows how much energy is required to move from place to place within our little uh, dual celestial object system here with the the Earth and the Moon. And a big part of what we're doing with Liftport is having a tether run through a soft land point at the Pico Gravity Station, which exists within the Lagrange point. So all this research actually shows that movement to the Lagrange point is one of the cheapest and efficient moves out of our planetary gravitational field and into an area that we can actually move throughout the entire uh, solar system or beyond from. And so it's it's pretty much stating that where we want to put the gravity state, the Pico gravity station, is going to become one of the most important locations in human history. 
Uh, let's let's expand on that a little bit. What do you mean by that? What I mean by that is that <laughs> to work against nature is foolish, and we'd never want to do anything of that of that uh, comprehension. So when we look at this Pico gravity station and its location within uh, EL, uh, EML1, we see working with the natural forces of gravity, though we have to fight against it to get there, once we're there, we're kind of on a pinnacle high point in which we can traverse throughout space without requiring an extreme amount of fuel or energy to get us moving. Okay. Right. And so to do that, you can do anything from cheap and efficient satellite repairs to the construction and launch of a magnificent spacecraft built for interstellar travel. Awesome, awesome. And uh, uh, Ken Murphy is going to go into a lot more detail, so I don't want to take away any of his thunder. But what are some of the surprising things that you learned in the creating this, uh, this image? It's just, it's really interesting to see, I mean, even from the fact that if we're to launch repeatedly to the moon, the amount of energy that that's going to require is just a absolutely astronomical. And the fact that fuel weighs, <laughs> you know, kilograms, and you have to use more fuel per kilogram you add, so adding fuel just means you have to add more fuel, which means you add more fuel. Right. I mean, this thing is just... Though it is cheap to get there, it could be there could be so many worse options going on. I don't even know how to explain it. I mean, there was it just kind of was eye opening to really understand how the system, how the how the system has to work within itself, and how this point, though not necessarily stationary in space, is always kind of there. And if we can utilize it, then we're only going to do a better thing for everyone. In the fact that we're going to save energy in going there, we're going to save materials, it's just going to be, I don't know, it just seems like uh, the mecca of space travel right now. Right. You said it's moving. What are you talking about? Well, I mean, it rotates. It's always directly between the Earth and the Moon. Okay. So it is, well, not not in the center, of course. It's, uh, it's much closer to the lunar surface. But yeah, yeah. it's rotating with the, the Moon as it rotates around the Earth. So, so what has to happen to the picogravity station because of that? The Pico Gravity Station, because of the movement, uh, the perigee and apogee of the moon, as well as its rotation, the Pico Gravity Station is going to have to actually be able to to relocate itself, in a certain sense, uh, closer and farther from the Earth, so that it maintains its position on the center of the Lagrange point. Okay, so it's going to have to climb up and down the ribbon just the same way that the lifter robot does, right? Exactly. But Luckily, it's, not, it's not going very far, but it's going to be moving a lot. Do you know what it is? It's going to be about one and a half kilometers an hour. I think it's one and a half kilometers a day, but I'll, we can check that math. Uh, no, you're right. It's a, you're right. You're absolutely right. It's a kilometer and a half an hour. You're right. Yes. Okay. All yeah, right. which is totally feasible, and though it's going to have to move uh, thousands of tens of thousands of kilometers or thousands of kilometers, it's going. It, it's only doing a, a few in a year. And so that's why that number is so low right. and definitely maintainable. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so we're going to explore this image a lot more in a couple days. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move on to... Uh, Rock on. Uh, let's, let's talk about the overall plan and some of the stuff that you're, uh, that you're creating as a result of this. And, and how did this plan come together? Sure. All right, let me pop that up real fast. Okay, so if we look at the actual plan itself. Cannon, I don't have a picture that you're showing me. Oh, it's up for me. Interesting. Let me... Uh... There you go. Good? All right. So <clears throat> the overall plan here, initially it started with the idea of we have to retrieve something from the moon. And in order to retrieve things from the moon, be that rare, rare metals or helium-3 or whatever you see fit for science or energy or even construction, these things need to somehow get off the moon without uh, using so much fuel that it's, it's just losing, it's, it's uh, underwater, that it's losing money every time we try it. And that is 
depleting us of the fuel that we're running low on already and petroleum things of that nature that's depleting anyways we need to get stuff off the moon so if we do this one the way that liftport's looking to do this is to launch kind of this harpoon ash spike into the ground that'll penetrate loose regular soil and open up in a semi like umbrella fashion and then it'll be secured by what we see here as like worm drive drills that will start to pull up regolith and put it inside this large pan. And so the idea for this is that we've established a ground connection with the lunar surface, allowing us to extend a tether up from itself and out into space beyond the Pico Gravity Lab at Lagrange Point 1, or EML 1, and out to the counterweight, which is 250,000 kilometers from the surface of the moon. In doing this, we run into a couple issues, such as the fact that we don't exactly know what's going on with the terrain underneath the surface, though we can establish a pretty decent idea. Okay. And then also, this thing needs to be able to hold to the lunar surface as it will be pulled off of it if it doesn't have enough structural support. So the distance that this thing needs to penetrate uh, the regolith is approximately 9 meters at the moment. We have to check on that and make sure with multiple tests, but right now we're just giving that the best shot as we can. And then the pan that it sits in, if you can see my mouse moving around, that item will be filled with regolith so that what we're looking to do is create a mountain on top of a pan on top of a spike that will guarantee there's absolutely no failure involved with this very significant connection to the surface. Right, because basically it's a billion dollar mistake if we somehow lose connection to the moon. Yeah. Um, scroll, scroll down a little bit. Absolutely. So what you see here is the actual plan. Initially this top picture was the elevation. Uh, this is the actual plan of the elevation. What we're looking top down, you see this bottom uh, octagon is showing that pan that I was talking about that would be filled. And then the second element, if you look at the top of the screen, is this ramp system that has a drive wheel on it as well and it it is set up to move up and down the, the ribbon so that these rovers here can climb up the ramp and dump regolith dirt constantly into that pan constructing that mountain. As that mountain of regolith dirt is dumped and constructed this secondary object with these ramps will climb up the tether always staying above the mountain right. and then it will it'll allow for that harpoon to be secured completely. The distance that that mountain needs to be still needs to be figured out mathematically, but we understand that there needs to be as many fail-safes as possible. So building that mountain and having those rovers do what they do 24 hours a day, seven days a week, is just the best idea that we can, we can come up with for efficiency for maintaining that connection. Okay, let's. Uh, I'm going to shift gears for a second. Let's move to the rover for a sec. Um, let's let's showcase that for a second. Then I'm going to chat about them for a minute. All right. Tell me if you don't see it. You see it? Yep. There we go. Great. All right. So this rover, I imagine nothing more than two and a half feet in, in its longest dimension. And the idea behind it, uh, this one specifically, was created to be powered by photovoltaics as well as a battery. There are discussions of whether or not we need photovoltaics on these small rovers and that they can retrieve as much energy as necessary when they come up to dump the regolith at the connection point. But for this initial purpose, it was just photovoltaic cells to allow for its power. And then it, ha it holds a conveyor belt that sits in front of it, allowing it to convey up the very loose lunar regolith, which requires almost no impact or crushing whatsoever. It's just shattered glass, more or less. This will co enter into a void inside the actual rover that will collect the regolith. There's a membrane underneath the void that will be pushed up and down uh, continuously to maintain a flat, or a, maintain a, a, I guess a flat surface of the regolith within the carrier, and to make sure that we can reach the highest volume that we need. It'll also help when the, when the um, when the rover needs to dump the regolith onto its, its platform. And so what we see here in the front part of this, this image 
is the, the rover actually picking up the regolith and dropping it into its void. And then on the back part of the image is what the trap door has opened, and the regolith is dumping out of the void into the secured cylinder, which is attached to the lifter that travels up and down the ribbon. So I want to point out a couple things for this. Um, that part of this design mimics some of the winners of the uh, NASA's Centennial Challenge for a regolith digger. So that's kind of important. It's not exactly the same, and there's some similarities and there's some variants there. But uh, but that's one of the things that kind of informed some of our initial decisions. We know that this is just version one and that that there's going to be an awful lot of changes over time but that this is kind of a starting point I want to point out that the rovers are going to be kind of in constant motion that first they're going to build up counter mass or sorry they're going to build up a mass underneath the uh, anchor station so we've got more for lack of a better term dirt to hold us down but then over time, we're also going to use that, that excess regolith to carry up to the space station, maybe to process, or eventually all the way up to the counterweight to add more mass to the counterweight because the larger and more uh, energy, or the more mass there is at the counterweight, the more we can carry on the ribbon. So those little rovers are going to be running for a while. Uh, we're anticipating four of them in the in the early stages. Um, let's uh, let's chat a little bit about the lifter, and then we're going to move on because we're I don't want to over uh, stretch our time here. Sure thing. All right, you got this one on the screen. Sure. Yep. That's the uh, that's the anchor station. A little bit more detail. Be brief on this. Yeah, absolutely. It's just showing that the lifter itself holds, as you see over here on the upper right, these red bars are indicating that's the payload storage that the rovers dump the regolith into. They are connected directly to the lifter itself and they enter into that secondary piece into a cage system so that no matter what the, reg the rovers are constantly dumping regolith in the same spot, sometimes there's a payload storage tube, sometimes there's not. So it's either putting regolith in to go out and up to space, as seen in this image here, or it's going to just be dumping regolith down on top of that pan, as we talked about. To look more closely into the actual lifter itself. All right. See here that the, the item holds an odd number of drive wheels, that maintain tension and allow it to maintain friction on the actual ribbon or tether as listed in this this image and then it will be traveling with those guide wheels with the use of photovoltaics that are assisting it up and down the ribbon these red payload storage units sit on the edge of just different structural members and they insert uh, into into that secondary piece with the ramps and then they will fill up. Once they're filled, they will lock closed. And then once all rovers are clear of dumping, the lifter itself will begin to ascend the, the ribbon and continue with its regular payload to wherever its destination may be. Yeah, I'm going to point out that this is a, a very, very early stage. Um, the, all of the design that, that we're working on right now is what I refer to as the, the first version of the lunar space elevator infrastructure. This is clearly not ready for a, a human-rated system. It doesn't allow for um, a wide variety of cargo and other systems. But our first priority is that stabilization of the base system. And then over time, with, with new rocket uh, rendezvous, we might switch out some of the components on the lifters or switch out the lifters entirely to give them broader and broader and broader capabilities. In right. this iterative development, as this is pretty much one of the first iterations and will definitely change probably 99%, what we have to focus on and what I've been trying to do mainly is to look at this system as a whole and to understand that our primary focus as a company is to connect to the moon and bring 
things up and things down at the most efficient price we can. Right on, right on. So in, in that mentality, we also are looking to, to use this iterative development to initially bring in the prospect of what this thing could be at its largest and how we would build there as we continue through literal time. If, if this thing was actually to be put into place in 10 years, right. then 20 years down the road, how is it going to be bigger? And how do we incorporate those design elements into it now so that we're in a much better place to make a much bigger system later on once we prove that it works? Right on, right on. All right, so um, we're running out of time. Uh, we're right at the 25-minute mark just about. Talk about the uh, the three designs that you are working on, and uh, maybe a little bit about what you're going to do this weekend at the International Space Elevator Conference. So I'm guessing the three designs that I'm working on are talking about the actual lifter, the the platform that it sits on, and as well as potentially the counterweight, and maybe a fourth as the Lagrange point station. Right. Right. The, the purpose of all of this is to look at, use that jack of all trades, and look at it as a big picture to be able to take all these separate elements, make sure they work together, and then make sure that they can be taken apart and inserted into a fairing that's going to be acceptable for us to launch this thing into, into space in one flight. Yeah. And so to be able to make something that can break down and reassemble and then be put into a small box and brought out to be over 250,000 kilometers long, that's going to be the real challenge. Yeah, for sure it is. So, uh, and w you're, what, are you, what are you going to do this weekend at the Space Elevator Conference? Uh, hopefully at the Space Elevator Conference I'll be conversing with people over the designs that were just shown in this video, uh, explaining the methods and mentality that we have about this project and looking for advice from anybody who's willing to participate and give ideas about design or input their information about what they know with you know physics or lunar gravity or regolith composition, who knows? I mean, there's a lot of things that we're going to need to learn. And so the more people that I know I can rely on and the more people that can give me different different answers or different, yeah, answers to questions that I have rapidly building, uh, that uh, that's going to be the major thing. Definitely. Awesome. It'll be really cool to talk to everyone about this, and it'd be nice to be able to show these designs off as meeting people in this community is going to be really critical for me at, through my continuation of my education. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. We're looking forward to having you. Uh, do you have any uh, last thoughts, uh, uh, or, or should we sign off? I think we're, I, I can't wait to see you tomorrow. <laughs> All right. Cool, man. All right. Looking forward to it. Thanks a lot. Take care. It's been great. Bye-bye.